Right. And tight, by the way. Okay, well, why don't we get started today? Uh, and we're going to just finish up a little bit on this instability and uh, uh, talk about a few complications, and then we'll go on to bone uh, injuries. So, uh, sorry about this. So these are the complications of instability, right? Yeah. So, thanks. So here we can just see a slap tear, but we've already looked at slap tears, so we don't need that. This is, uh, um, you're all familiar with the anatomy around the, the shoulder. One of the areas we'll be concerned about is down here in the axillary recess. Uh, now, uh, another complication that you're all aware of, let me go back here, are uh, uh, cysts in the suprascapular and the spinoglenoid notch. And uh, as you're all aware, the uh, innervation to the supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscles actually comes from the axillary nerve, which comes up posteriorly. And uh, either in the suprascapular notch or farther down in the spinal glenoid notch, you can compress that nerve if you have masses. And if it's uh, the, more, the, the uh, suprascapular notch, you then will tend to uh, affect the uh, Ner uh, innervation of the supraspinatus muscle. If it's in the spinal glenoid notch more inferiorly, you can get the, inner, the nerve before it goes to the two and you can get both muscles involved. So seeing that can help you uh, do the location. So I uh, will talk about the sub suprascapular notch and the spinal glenoid notches. Uh, and here's kind of a, another a example of this. The suprascapular nerves comes up here and uh, innervates the, uh, has a branch going over to the supraspinatus muscle. Uh, more inferiorly, uh, it has branches, oh, I'm sorry, it comes from the suprascapular nerve, excuse me, not the axillary nerve. And, uh, and uh, more distally here, if you have a, uh, a, uh, a uh, cyst or something, that compresses the nerve, you'll just get involvement of the infraspinatus muscle, whereas higher up you can get both muscles involved. I stated that incorrectly before. And here are where those, those spaces, the suprascapular notch area and the, is up in this region, uh, superior to the glenoid, uh, and the quadrilateral space is way down here. So the course of the suprascapular nerve, it arises from the upper, upper trunk of the cervical nerves, runs lateral beneath the trapezius, uh, enters the supraspinatus fossa through the suprascapular notch uh, before the transverse scapular ligaments, and then passes underneath here, and has uh, two branches to the supraspinatus and two to the infraspinatus muscles. And so here's an, uh, here it comes down through here, as we can see. Here are the branches to the supraspinatus, and here's the branches to the infraspinatus down through here. So a cyst up here could get both of them, a cyst farther down here would just get the infraspinatus. And typically, uh, the cysts here are paralabral cysts, uh, which uh, extend joint foot extending through a, a labral tear adjacent to the to the notches. And uh, but they can, they, you can get very large cysts, and they can extend upward and downward. And it, and it may be a cause of uh, rotator cuff weakness. And this is something we always look for and uh, uh, athletes who develop weakness of uh, these muscles. And it's typical cysts. And so here's just another diagram of, uh, here you can see a cyst, uh, in this case, compressing the, the, the nerve. Uh, so this is that's a list. That, that's the axillary nerve. The axillary nerve's down here, yes. OK. So, Yes. Um, I, guess, I guess anatomically speaking, is there something different in, in the way that you use a paralabral cyst versus a ganglion cyst? Because on that image it said ganglion cyst. Uh, uh, I personally think the term ganglion shouldn't even be used. Uh, it's, it's kind of a meaningless term. These are just cysts, and then you could argue about where they come from. Ganglion doesn't really mean anything in, in this particular setting. 
used, but the, the terms are often interchanged. Uh, if you can demonstrate that the fluid is coming from a tear in the uh, labrum and extending into a space where you normally would not have a joint space, then we typically call those paralabral cysts, uh, indicating that the it's the labral tear that's the source of the fluid, which which uh, the cyst. Often, if there's no obvious source, or if it's the the cyst is a, seems to be associated with a tendon or a ligament, then people uh, sometimes call those ganglion cysts. But uh, personally, the the term ganglion is kind of a meaningless term, and I think it's just it would be better just to say it's a cyst and describe its location and what you think the source of the fluid might be if you can. And if you can't, then you just describe the cyst in a location and not use the term ganglion. John, do you have an opinion about that? Well, m mostly when we talk about ganglion cysts, we're talking about the wrist um, or the foot. Uh, we're talking about paralabral cysts and so on, that's something different. Yeah. But uh, the fluid is the same, uh, the tissue surrounding um, the cyst is the same as a ganglion, so it really doesn't make any difference which which word you use, except uh, the ganglion cyst may be distant uh, from um, like a labral cyst. Obviously, you have you can have cysts anywhere in the body. It doesn't have to be the joint. Yeah, but m most of the ganglion cysts in the wrist and the foot <coughs> come from the uh, from the joint space. Uh, that's right, that's correct. Um, yeah, the same thing in the knee and uh, whatever, but but I think that but I don't think there's a difference in definition. The main thing what you have to do is give the location yeah. um, and, uh, and, and then describe what you see. Okay. I, I, I'm not sure I could care less whether it's ganglion or paralabral. Uh, but but uh, it's, it's just we're used to certain areas of the body where we call ganglion cysts, uh, and and that's usually uh, is the wrist or the foot. Yeah. And so here you can see a cyst going into the suprascapular notch region, and through here is where the the suprascapular nerve courses, and you can see where it could p potentially be impacted by by this cyst. So, uh, Dan, what do you think of this case? 23-year-old male, uh, rule out contusion or tear. We have a chrono, uh, looks like a PD fat sat with contrast on board. This is orthogram. Uh, it looks like there is a irregularity of the superior labrum, um, suspicious for a tear, but the secondary sign, there is like a cystic lesion, kind of like medial to the glenoid uh, in the supracapillar notch. Um, and uh, this, on the chrono view, it just shows that there's this kind of like a moderate size, kind of like maybe bilobed um, paralabral cyst or ganglion cyst in the subscapular. Yeah, yeah, super Yeah, it's kind of like, I guess, in compressing it. But the muscle bulks, I don't think, uh, I mean, I don't know if you could hallucinate, there's a little maybe like increased signal within both supraspinous and infraspinous muscle bellies. So it could be some like, you know, early degeneration. Um, so, so this is a suprascapular knot cyst, which is extending inferiorly enough where it's actually affecting, remember there are two nerve branches that go to each of these muscles, and it's affecting the superior branch to the infraspinatus, not the inferior branch, and it's affecting both branches to the supraspinatus, and you can see edema within the muscles uh, due to the acute denervation uh, from, the, from the cyst. So there is some like subscapular, it's kind of like, you know, superiorly like there's a little increasing up to Over it. here? Yeah. yeah, I don't remember what that is. We'd have to look at the other images to see what's going on there. Okay. So we have two axial PD saturated images uh, of the shoulder and uh, there's a uh, edema within the posterior glenoid and uh, abnormality uh, with the posterior labrum being torn and looks like it's displaced proximally and there's this large cyst tracking posteriorly along the glenoid in the location of the spinal glenoid notch. 
Um, and then on the sagittal uh, T2 image, see that cyst again. Um, not, not really seeing much in terms of signal changes of the muscle belly, though. Maybe it's a little subtle change, um, but not as significant as we saw before. So. Okay, there you can see it much better, the edema within the infraspinatus from denervation. Uh, John, what do you think? John, go ahead. <clears throat> uh, yeah, um, I, I was going to ask, um, what would you do with that? So. Um, well, it looks like the source of the tear, or the source of the cyst, uh, is from the posterior labral tear. So if you go in and see if you can address the tear, then you can prevent the, the mass effect from the cyst. But if this is chronic, exactly. tear, then... Otherwise, you won't go away. You can't do anything about it. So if you don't fix uh, the, the problem, uh, the cyst will uh, recur. Thanks, John. I mean, like you can aspirate it um, using um, uh, radiological techniques and a, a long spinal needle, uh, aspirate the cyst, but it'll come back if you don't uh, fix the problem. I've never aspirated uh, one of these, but uh, uh, and then put cortisone in them, but. I suppose that may be something that a radiologist could try to do, uh, and then and then if that doesn't work, then go ahead and do surgery. Yeah, I but I I might uh, consider uh, asking one of you folks to uh, interventional radiologists to see what they can do with it. Yeah, certainly these can be aspirated, and it's it's generally thought that if you don't put steroid or something like that in it, that uh, yeah, a really long-acting steroid like. Um, yeah. A wrist is span, and that's about it. That doesn't absorb for two weeks. Yeah. I don't know the, uh, I'm not aware of any large studies. That doing that. I, I don't either, John. I, uh, I, I certainly know quite a few people who do it. Uh, I, my limited experience, I've, I've probably just has been very biased because I've just seen ones that come back with recurrent symptoms to get, get it imaged again. So I've seen a, a, several of those over the years where they have recurred and they've, they've ended up having to have arthroscopic surgery uh, because, because they've recurred. And then obviously if the patient has symptoms associated with the labral tear, that would be another reason why you'd want to fix the labral tear rather than just treat the cyst. It, 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 the thing is, um, cysts are on the knee. I've aspirated and injected cortisone long standing. And then you press and bandage for a while. And, and I've had cases where they didn't recur. Good. Quite a few, quite a few actually. I don't see any reason why that wouldn't work around the shoulder. Okay. Well, I know people I'm, do it. I'm just to, to aspirate one of these around the shoulder. And then, uh, but, might keep you from having to have surgery if you don't need surgery for other reasons. You bet. Yeah. Okay, uh, Jonah, what do you think of this? Okay, so we've got a sagittal T2 image, um, and what we're seeing is sort of an oval-shaped uh, cystic uh, lesion uh, kind of adjacent to the uh, labrum there, so I think this could be a, a paralabral cyst. Um, okay. So it enter extension of a paralabral cyst. Yeah, and it extends up into the Super spinatus notch <coughs> up there. Okay, uh, here's a here's another patient where we have an arthrogram, and I just want to point out here's a T1 weighted image where we can see a nice arthrogram appearance here. But when you go to the you can see a tear of the posterior labrum here, but when you go to the fluid sensitive image, you can see this is a big non communicating cyst uh, that's a paralabral cyst associated with the labral tear, but the they don't always communicate 
freely with the joint space. Often the fluid in the cyst becomes very inspissated and kind of thickened. Sometimes if you do delayed imaging, you'll see enhancement right around the area of the of where it connects to the to this to the tear, and then gradually it, it, you can get more contrast extending into these. But very frequently, uh, when you at the time of the arthrogram, right after you've you've put in the agent, uh, these paralabel cysts will not communicate uh, aggressively with the joint space, and you may not see them until you look at the fluid sensitive images. Uh, a number of years ago, I saw uh, a couple of cases where in order to save time, people would put contrast into the joint space and just do T1 and T1 fat set images afterwards and no fluid sensitive images, and a couple of these were missed. So it's important to do a complete study and not take shortcuts. Okay. And here we can see another big cyst. And here's another cyst. This uh, one. Yes. What uh, T2 imaging uh, show, show the cyst? Yes, it does show it. And that's why that's why I said here you must include a T2 or a fluid sensor type image in order to see the cyst whenever you well, do studies. You don't need uh, contrast. Uh, I'm not a big fan of arthrography, but there are a lot of people out there who really uh, like arthrography. So I, I, I personally don't recommend arthrography to the shoulder. Because I think with current imaging, with our current techniques, we have very good sensitivity and specificity. But there's still quite a few people uh, out in the community who like to do arthrography when they do uh, shoulder imaging. Thank you. Okay, and then here's just another big cyst. And that, this is one that just shows, uh, here we can see the nice big cyst here on the T2-weighted images. On the T1 fat set images, we can just see a little bit of contrast extending into the cyst. So as I was saying before, sometimes these can can have uh, kind of very uh, poor communication. And because of the viscosity of the fluid in the cyst, uh, you may not really get good mixing between the contrast, which trickles in, and the cyst itself. So here we can clearly see the size of the cyst on the fluid sensitive images. But on the T1 fat set images, it looks like we just have these little tiny little cysts. And that's just because that's where the contrast is leaking in, and it's not really distributing well within the cyst itself. So just, just be aware of that. Okay. Uh, Jeff, what do you think of this case? A uh, 46-year-old man was shot. Shot? In the... Yeah, I misspelled shoulder. Oh, well, I'll fix that one. There should be an ER there. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, okay. <laughs> so he was shot. Is that right? <laughs> shot in the left shoulder. <laughs> it should be shoulder. Uh, okay, wearing a, a Kevlar jacket. Uh, okay. So, and this uh, frontal, basically it's a frontal view of the chest. Uh, I'd looking at the left uh, scapula, and uh, it definitely is uh, displaced superiorly. Uh, well, I mean, significantly superiorly. The spinal, I mean, you can see the spine as well is, uh, it's, it's is really angulated. We have a, a rotated rotation. Yeah. Or, yeah. Uh, and uh, on this axillary view, or Y view, I should say, um, I can see it that the the spine appears to be this uh this uh, it appears that the shoulder uh, let's see uh well i mean it's essentially I, I mean it looks like that the i mean the shoulder itself is intact i mean the the articulation of the humerus of the um the glenoid is is stable itself and um so what we have I mean, it's essentially like a some kind of scapulo uh, dissociation, scapular. Uh, okay. uh, so, so the scapular uh, dissociation, such as due have to uh, positioned here, and, yeah. and this is called scapulothoracic dis dislocation, and you yeah. can see that you've really dislocated the joint, the scapulothoracic joint here, and the acromion okay. process should be up on top. Uh, this should be the medial margin of the scapula. Now it's the superior margin, so it's really rotated. 
uh, substantially uh, in this particular shoulder. If we go back, you can see this is uh, normal, and you can see just how, how uh, far the, that left scapula has rotated. Uh, and that, that's due to basically he essentially had butt force trauma with uh, having the Kevlar jacket on. John, do you want to comment on this? Uh, yeah, it, it seems to me like this would be uh, a con um, and uh, probably a nerve injury. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Caused it as well as muscle injury. Yes. So, yeah. And, and so, how would this be treated? Uh, it, I mean, is it essentially a, is it the muscle like you're saying the muscles are is it essentially I guess a tearing. Uh, well, get, get, get an MRI. Uh, to see, uh, see what you can see in terms of uh, structures, and, and then proceed from there. I, I don't think you would go in and do a surgery. Uh, you would wait uh, and, and see what happens. Uh, but I, I would get an MRI and, and and wait some time and get another one later if, if need be. Uh, when when things quiet down, these are very painful injuries and. Uh, and uh, I don't think I'd want to move this patient around too much. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure what the treatment is. And then we've talked a little bit about the quadrilateral space underneath here. And uh, and here's the the name. It comes because it's a four-sided space here. Uh, and here's the lung head of the triceps, the, the uh, teres minor, and the teres major muscles coming around here, and then the humerus, and this is the space, and then there's the axillary nerve that comes through here, uh, which innervates the, the deltoid muscle, anterior deltoid. And the quadrilateral space syndrome comes from compression of the axillary nerve uh, or the artery in this, in this area. Uh, it can become from fibrous bands, it can be due to cysts, uh, especially inferior labral cysts and also tumors in hematoma. And uh, dull pain and, and weakness. And then, so always be concerned about it when you see focal atrophy of the teres minor muscle. Uh, the vast majority of time I've seen focal atrophy of the teres minor muscle, when you look in the quadrilateral space, it looks pretty normal but it's probably due to the fact that you've had some uh, strain of the uh, axillary nerve, and you may not be able to see that on standard MR images. Okay. And you can also get intramuscular cysts, which we're, we can see here. And then obviously... Uh, other things that you can see, you can see loose bodies, uh, which can be uh, definitely things you have to comment on in your report, which uh, certainly may be important, especially if the intermittent symptoms of the shoulder, then if uh, uh, these may have to be removed if they're thought to be a cause of symptoms. Okay, well, why don't we stop here for now, and... Uh, uh, so it's what I'm gonna.